know if you can see this at the back, no? Okay. Well, the Dangerous Drugs Board, together with the uh, other uh, concerned agencies, the Department of Interior and Local Government, together with the PNP, the SWD, and the Department of Health, came up with a logarithm on how we should, uh, we could provide services to all of these surrenderings. As I mentioned earlier, we already have around 6,900 plus, uh, so almost 700,000 surrenderings in the country. So if you have 7,000, 700,000 rather, 700,000 surrenderings in the countries, let's assume that 1%, 1 percent, 1 percent will would require an inpatient program. So that's about 7,000 individuals that would require inpatient uh, treatment uh, rehabilitation. On the other hand, out of that number, 2 to 10 percent, as I mentioned earlier, would require an outpatient program. And the rest, the rest, 90%, around 600, 630,000 individuals would require community-based interventions no? to prevent them from progressing no? into their addiction, into problematic drug users. So basically what, what the uh, provisional guidelines state is that you need to have, you need to prepare the communities, the communities has, has a big role as far as uh, providing interventions to uh, drug users are concerned. Remember, health was devolved to the local government units. The, uh, the local chief executives are the one in charge of all the municipal health centers nationwide. They are even in charge of the provincial and uh, the district, the district health system in the country. No? So at their level, at the community level, they should be providing primary interventions. No? That's what we're saying. Okay? So it entails a lot of community preparation. And who will do this? The local anti-drug abuse council. If you recall, I think you're all familiar that DILG already issued a memorandum circular trying to strengthen advocating the strengthening of the anti-drug abuse council at the uh, councils at various levels now from the provincial level down to the municipal city level and even down to the barangay level and section 51 of republic act 9165 states that local chief local government units are supposed to provide allocation to provide resources to this anti-drug abuse council, especially for treatment and rehab. No? So that's the role of the local government units. They need to activate, I don't know if you can see this, no? but I'll leave a copy. If you're interested, you can copy it. No? Uh, I don't know if you can see this. Even I myself cannot see this. <laughs> uh, the, the first thing that they need to do is activate the anti-drug abuse council at their own levels. No? The anti-drug abuse councils will now map the resources available in their respective areas. So for example, in one barangay, we have a church-based organizations active. Then you list them down as one of the possible service providers. No? Do you have private organizations, Rotary, Lions, who can help assist in the provision of uh, interventions, then you need to map them, you need to list them down. Now, what are the available resources at their level, no? which they can tap, okay? At the same time, the Department of Health already downgraded money in all Department of Health regional offices to provide capacity building activities, no? So local government units, especially the uh, paramedicals in the uh, rural health units will be trained how to conduct, number one, screening, no? and number two, assessment. I will discuss the difference between the two. No? So first, they need to be capacitated how to properly screen individuals. No? So for example, at the screening level, you have, for example, in, uh, in Amono Rizal, we have around 8,000 surrenderies. 
So you need to differentiate the surrenderies with criminal records or with pending cases in courts. No? Those individuals will be separated. No? There is a separate guidelines um, uh, published by uh, the Philippine Drug Enforcement Agency for individuals who have pending cases. Okay? But for individuals who have surrendered because they are using drugs and they want to seek treatment, then they will undergo screening. No? So we're talking about persons without prior or pending cases as far as this guideline is concerned. No? Those with prior cases, those with criminal records will be given to the enforcement sector for further evaluation. Okay? okay? So this algorithm will only pertain to cases without, uh, to surrenderies without prior pending cases. No? Surrenderies who require treatment intervention. They are simple drug users. Okay? They have not violated any provision of 9165 except Section 15, drug use. No? Okay. But well, that's clear. No? So they will be trained to conduct screening and we have the following tools already available. In fact, it was already translated. Uh, we now have the English and the Tagalog version of this one, Assist. Again, who will utilize these tools? It's the local government uh, paramedical units. No? Usually from the rural health uh, centers of these uh, local government units. So they will be trained to use Assist and what it does, no, it differentiates, it differentiates between a morbidity, a disease, or a behavioral condition. How does it differentiate between the two? Well, if using the assist tool, it was revealed that the person the, the, the person exhibits low behavioral risk. No? low behavioral risk, low risk. No? That means, yes, okay, he only has a behavioral condition. He used drugs, not because he is addicted to drugs, but because he has so much time in his hands, he was not informed properly, he was not educated properly, No, uh, he doesn't have any job, and so he wants to just uh, fill up his time, but he is not a problematic drug user. Basically, that's the point, no? So what do you do? If he's low risk, you can refer, the local government unit can refer him to a community-based intervention program, which has the following, no? It has a brief intervention regimen, it has social support regimen, if it requires Psycho-education, then he will be located. If he needs skills development, skills training, then he can be provided livelihood activities. And this can be done through TESDA. No? TESDA, in all regions, provides startup funds for these activities. All you need to do is just coordinate with TESDA regional offices. They are already aware of this program. No? So, Maybe their moral foundation is not as uh, as founded, so the church-based organizations can even provide moral, spiritual guidance to these individuals. But the point is, they don't have any morbidity as of yet, no? and that's the reason why they will assist as having low risk behavioral condition. Okay, is that clear so far? We're still clear. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, what happens? If the individual is assessed to have high or moderate risk, no? Okay, that would mean he needs to undergo another level of assessment. And this time, this assessment procedure should be done by a professional, usually a, a doctor, a physician, or even a psychologist, no? At the local government unit. And this time, they're using another tool. They're using DSM, Diagnostic Statistical Manual 5, which is the standard 
uh, addiction tool that uh, uh, inter uh, we're, we're using at the international level. No? So what does it say? What does DSM-5 say? You're either a mild substance use, substance use, uh, you either have a mild substance use disorder or a moderate substance use disorder or finally a severe substance use disorder. These are medical terms, no? But uh, I think you, you will be more familiar if you talk about your level of dependency that you're familiar with. As far as mild substance use disorders are concerned, concerned these are the experimenters, the casual users. Okay, I think you're familiar with that term, no? The experimenters, casual users. The moderate substance use disorders would be would mean these are the habitual and even substance abusers in the old parlance. No? And finally, for severe use disorder, these are the drug dependents. These are drug dependents with comorbidities that require further hospital treatment. No? So there are three levels, basically. And as I mentioned earlier, 0.6 to 1% would require this one, the inpatient program. And as I mentioned, we accept we accept four modalities, but of course, as you can see here, you have black boxes, black boxes. Why? Because there is no one treatment uh, that would fit every individual. Every treatment should be highly individualized. So you can insert whatever program that you deem necessary for every individual that would require inpatient program. The same way for outpatient program, there are black boxes there. No? Again, there is no one size fits all as far as uh, tre treatment of addiction is concerned. So you can add your own uh, interventions as far as these persons are concerned. So what would be the difference as far as uh, these interventions are concerned? Again, those uh, with low risk would only require community-based